Well, firstly, hi, everyone, and thank you for coming to our talk. Um, we're sort of really glad that you're interested in hearing a little bit about sort of our approach to search, which is starting sort of from the opposite end of, I guess, the sort of conventional wisdom, which is the index and, and, um, and the technology. And we try and sort of shift it to the other end, which is what are users trying to achieve and, you know, what's the purpose of the search application that you guys are working with. Um, are we a bit loud? Are you okay? Um, so firstly, I guess we are all here because we're sort of unified in our belief that, you know, search is an incredible technology. It represents a complete paradigm shift from the, the traditional way of doing things, which was with databases that were optimized for storing things, whereas the bulk of the user experience is all about pulling stuff out, right? That's you know, what we're always trying to achieve. And, and as incredible as this technology is, we are sort of often, we slip into this focus on the plumbing, right? Which is a big challenge, and it's all about sort of being able to wire all these things up. But we think this is focus on the engine, if you will, and the connectors getting the data into the index, the algorithms, the scaling of it, as important as that is, um, there is a sort of, a little bit of a risk that whether we're using solar in one case or elastic, it doesn't really sort of matter too much. But if we lose sight of the application that the people are going to be using, we're losing sight of quite a critical thing, right? Which is users, right? What are they trying to achieve with the stuff that you're building? And user experience is something that has been traditionally very hard to do. I mean, we've built a little business around it, and we think that the reason many projects fail is because people generally are not very good at visualizing an outcome or an application from specifications and wireframes and things like that. And yet, the application that they use is really what determines the success of a project. Because if you leave it to the sort of last mile of budget, the last 10% of the effort, there is a risk that you will have done all of this important foundational work, but what the users get is a text box and 10 blue links or whatever it may be. And when you take what is already quite a difficult problem and you compound it by the fact that there is a real separation between the business and the developers, there is a risk that you will deliver something that doesn't meet their specifications. Even though everything is in place, users are funny. It's really difficult to do exactly what they want. And when you think about search, people are not coming to your application to see how incredibly fast it is. Yes, again, it's important, but we take it for granted, right? Everything is fast these days. But they're always coming to you with a real sort of intent and purpose. They're trying to achieve something. They have a question, and they're you know, sort of, the answer is somewhere in the data, and it's how you surface it that we think is really important. And to date, we think that sort of, the only real option for you has, to be, has been to build everything from scratch, right? You can choose Angular and things like that, and it will make your job a lot easier. Or you start from something like Vue, or whatever sort of each technology has built in. Um, but sort of, if we leave you with just one takeaway from this talk, it is that you need to design for the audience of your application, right? And people come to your, your sort of search app either because they're surfing the web, and search has become a really good sort of destination, if you will, that if you're watching the Olympics, you will type in maybe Usain Bolt, you know, how many medals does he have? And search is incredible for this sort of stuff, and it will do it at scale. Or even if you think about the use case, if you're looking for a job, you have a very particular frame of mind, right? You, you can be given a bit more complexity. You know that you'll be selecting sort of your salary range or whatever it may be, the location, and the more specific the audience is, the more complexity they will handle, generally. So if you look at the upper end of the scale, you might be, your, your users might be doing anti-money laundering or e-surveillance in a bank, or they might be doing drug discovery. They will have a particular sort of view of what this application should do. And you have to also then keep in mind that 90% of your cases, your application will have to work on mobile devices. 
And if you can make sure that that is a seamless thing and you're not having to maintain two code bases, that's obviously a massive benefit. And that, again, has become much easier with sort of responsive design, et cetera, and you know all these things, but it's just sort of something to keep in mind. So what we decided to do, and this is going back six years, we've been, well, I've been in search for about 13 years, and we thought if we can sort of take the problem of building a search application and just break it down in the right way, we have all of these components that have sort of a logical abstraction. You can build any type of application, right? It needs to be fast and responsive. Um, it needs to be rugged. It needs to be enterprise strength out of the box. You know, that was something we commonly saw when I was in services at, at, at Fast before it was acquired by Microsoft, is that we were always doing the same thing over and over again, which was taking an application, building it out to spec, and then deploying it in an enterprise. So dealing with security and things like that was always a core part of what we did. So we're not gonna bore you with sales, but we are TwigKit, so this is what we do. Um, and um, what we have done and what we wanna show you is an application we've just actually deployed, but we hope this doesn't bore you too much. We recorded it this morning. Uh, we wanna just show you, sort of walk you through what it means for us to build an application. And if we, well, questions. Sorry, you can interrupt me whenever you want. Um, or, and hackle or do whatever. Um, we have a bit of a sort of a, a walkthrough. And, hello. Let me just switch to quick. Might be easier for me to stop and stuff. Is if you compare us to something like Vue, right? We almost represent different starting points in the life cycle. So what we do when we're doing projects we tend to sort of pick a template that's a good starting point for you. We know this works well for enterprise search or for analytics and discovery. And like a good cooking show, we've skipped a couple of steps here that we've downloaded an application and it has a very sort of basic structure and a template. And you can see that we break it up sort of into blocks on a page. And what this really gives you is nothing, right? It's just sort of a blank template. And the first task of building a search application for us is you need to know where your data is, right? And we point it at a particular solar instance and it's sort of centrally configured where that lives. You build a query from say the URL or however you want to do it, um, all the parameters in this case. And then fairly simply, we send the query to a platform and we get a response. And this again represents the sort of plumbing of things for us and obviously nothing happens. And the most sort of core task of any search application would be to I guess show the results, right? Um, oh, no, we need a text box as well. So you can see what we're doing here. We're sort of just declaring components, right? We're placing them on the page where we want them. We have attributes to sort of determine what these components do. Um, and I'm going to try and pause this. Can you hit yeah. the space bar? Oh, in a bit. Let it run. And then we have the task that I was talking about, printing out the results that come back from the search engine. And if you think about, if you pause this now for me, or not. Um, what this is, what we were doing there is, um, can you just flick back a little bit? That's speed, okay, cool. We think this is really important, as geeky as it may be. You know, our, what we do here is, we have obtained a response from Solar, in this case. We pass it into the result list tag. And when you don't give it any more information than this, all it knows to do is to dump out all the documents and all the fields within it, right? Not particularly clever or engaging, but it is really important if you're on a greenfield site and you just wanna see what's in the index, right? So now you can press play. So this is what we would call sort of great defaults, minimum configuration, and it does something meaningful for you. Like, voila, here are the documents that are coming back. And we have an index that we deployed with sort of all of the Nobel uh, prize winners from, 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 um, from. Like in the stuff. 1800s, yeah. 1800s. So here now we know what's coming back, and if my beautiful assistant presses play, <laughs> what we're now going to do is a, is a bit more stuff in a similar vein. So facets, dynamic navigation, whatever you call it, in our sort of view of the world, it follows the same convention. If you give the facet list a response, and you tell it, print out all the facets that come back, pff, obviously it does that, right? And again, sort of fairly minimal configuration, but this is not what we want. So what we do is you are now responsible for adding the complexity, right? 
what fields do you want to show for each document that's coming in back? Break out the tag and just declare it. I want to show the full name field. Boom. Um, I want to style it in a certain way. So again, you can see here that the sort of the, the, the point is, let's make everything by configuration. You're not writing any sort of low-level code because low-level code in the view is a no-no, right? Because that's where you get bugs and maintainability issues. And we're doing just naughty things here. We're adding a couple of fields, but these are the ones that you know, make up the application. I want to put the label above. Again, just a sort of style declaration, what we call it. And the point of this is not just showing you how we approach the problem, but sort of give you also food for thought about how you can logically break up your code. Um, so, boom, a few sort of salient points about these clever individuals. Change the, the thing here. But now we start seeing data issues. When you start bringing back data from Solar, you may notice that there are sort of nuances in the index. And, and for example, we noticed that when we looked at the age field, which is how old the person was when they got the award, um, we get back a multi-valued field. So there's two, you know, twice the 82. So again, you need to be able to deal with that at query time. And again, if you can do that by sort of declaring your intention, which is to show one, blah, there it goes. And again, sort of what we think we've done over the last seven years is catered for all of these sort of nuances that we keep seeing time and time again. And even though these are just sort of a few lines of markup of HTML, it's actually doing quite a lot for you. It's getting rid of a lot of boilerplate. I can't even remember what we're doing now. Okay, yeah, sort of little bit of plumbing there. We obviously need uh, breadcrumbs to show the user what they've selected and where they are in their sort of little discovery mission. And then we are going to show you how you format facets. Again, in exactly the same sort of methodology, we keep try and be really sort of rigorous and, and stick to it, you will then say, okay, for each one of those facets, I want to truncate the number of characters, because that will break, say, in the mobile view. And there was a lot of facets there, so let's make them collapsible and show maybe five by default and 10 if they click show more. Um, again, the UI responds, and you can see the methodology here. You're almost doing this, a prototype from scratch, and you're able to show your users throughout the journey what happens and how their data behaves in the shape of it people with mustaches in chemistry, um, which is surprisingly common, I'll tell you. So, and facets are really good because they're giving you insight into the data set. When I typed in mustache, it's, the search engine is an amazing technology in that it will tell me information about the data set. Are there any people with mustaches, especially women? But um, what we can then also use facets for is we can show them in different ways, right? We can use them to give the people the sort of big slices through their data. Show them as tabs rather than on the side, because this is sort of, to a user, tells me I'm making a sort of a big distinction here between data. And in this case, then we don't need to show it on the side. Again, like, you just do minus price category, and it disappears. So we're making some progress with our, with our little application. Um, what are we doing now? Ah, institution. Okay. Quite a key sort of thing, you know, we think, is where did these people study? And what we would do, again here, rather than change code, just say, I want the institution to come at the top. And there's a lot of institutions in the world, so let's give the user something more to work with. I may not want to scroll through 150 facet filters on the side, so I can say, if I find the institution facet, I'm gonna do something special. I want to let the user search within it to help them find exactly the values that they want. So you're essentially doing here a search within search results, right? So you get everyone that went to Harvard Medical School, like these fine gentlemen. But um, now we get to the sort of more of the UX side of things. We've plumbed everything up, but there's here like a lot of white space, obviously not what we want to do. So we get back to our little styling directives and we say, I want each one of these to be a card. And you can imagine when it comes to data, it might be cards, it might be sort of typical search results, or it might be a table. It doesn't really matter. It depends on the shape of the data and what your users are trying to do. And let's show not three side by side, but four, and, and if you're on a small device, just give me one, right? So now you start sort of filling out the screen, making the most of the real estate. But you saw it didn't actually, wasn't divisible by four, so let's change the query for the user, 
and have them retrieve 12 results instead, and voila, it pulls up. So now we sort of are, are, are making progress through this, and what everybody wants to do these days is pagination has been going away. Like we're used to now sort of uh, infinite scrolling of these applications, and that's again something that's quite tricky to achieve technically. So you want to reduce the amount of code needed to do that, and in our view of the world, you would just say, I want this thing to infinite scroll, and here's my platform. So let the thing just do it for you. And like, it may have started off as a naughty little sort of template, but it's slowly but surely becoming something you can give to your users and say, what would you like to change? And they might say, well, I actually don't care how old they are. I want to see something completely different. And then you can respond by just changing standard HTML that's doing the sort of magic for you. And now we're gonna let people sort on age and surname, something like that. Again, all of the, if, I bet if you think back to your projects, they all have these similar themes. You expect certain things from search, and it's about powering that, but then also give you the ability to hook into this life cycle and do whatever you want. But the business logic you are writing is something that is absolutely core to your audience, right? So you don't wanna be spending time on sort of efficiently talking to solar, try and sort of abstract that into its own library and just fetch the data that you need. So, search also, and this is different from the sort of traditional BI type view of the world, which is very deterministic, search lets you efficiently navigate data across any dimension. And if you can let your users do that, for example, by saying, for each one of the values I'm showing, make it clickable. Have it automatically rewrite my query so that I can go in any direction and, um, and explore the data and see what people are doing. And we had a, um, one field has a, a sort of uh, an image link. So again, just to clear that, it's nice to see that. Images are nice. I can't tell you how annoyed the person was that had to download all of these and find them. <laughs> There's only 900 of them. Um, and again, true to the same paradigm, Solar lets you do something way more than, say, those of you that know the Google search appliance, right? It has serious capabilities, and as you will have known, you have the ability to, to dynamically create ranges and things like that. So this is how we would augment the query and give it something only Solar would understand. And you can see here we're creating a range facet that's sort of relative to our current time. And what this will do for us is when we, when we submit this as a part of the query, we get back a different type of response. Now we're getting these sort of years all grouped by, by decade, which is what Solar is doing for us automatically, but the response is different. The, the whole thing needs to now behave differently. But once you have it in these buckets and in the right order that you want them, you may want to use the facets slightly differently. And that's not just give people a, a dumb link, but say, I'm gonna treat the year slightly differently because Solar is doing that for me. And I want to show the buckets as sort of a histogram. So again, sort of introducing visualizations and give the user a slider to select between them. Because if it is along a time series, that's what we logically think of, of doing. So again, having as many components packaged together allows you to give your user something much more compelling and again, not a typical enterprise application. People want something like Facebook, LinkedIn. It has to have that sort of fidelity that they, they get in their everyday lives. Introducing some CSS, everybody knows how to do that. You can give it to any one of your sort of web designers and say, style this, make it adhere to the corporate branding. We give you like little nifty themes that you can just sort of um, adapt slightly, now replace the logo, and it's becoming sort of almost the application we want, except I don't know how to spell Ozumi if I just hear that. So when people start typing, again, what are you used to seeing on Facebook? You're used to seeing instant results that start popping down as you type. I want my search box to do something more, so I break it out. I give it some more specific instructions. Like, I know where the data came from, I know that if I'm doing instant result, this is what I would like to see. I would like to see a little picture, their name, and maybe their sort of um, academic field or area. So exactly the same markup you saw when you were printing out the results. Because again, it's the same thing coming back from Solar, um, but just sort of slightly different styling. And it now this result list lives within the text box. And as the user starts typing, you get sort of instant results. 
and they behave differently to query suggestions. When you think about query suggestions, that's something you accept, and you, you use that as a query term, but we're also used to, when we click on one of these, I want to be taken to a destination, right? And that's what we call sort of landing or topic pages. Do you want to pause it a bit? So, questions? There's more. We're going to show you more. Yes, sir. That's, that's right, yeah. All, what we're showing you here is just responding to whatever Solar gives you, right? Because again, that's where the expertise lies. I think, I bet most of you in this room, I'm, sort of, if you're on the sort of engineering side of things, you know exactly what to do with Solar, and you have a documentation reference that tells you exactly how to do every one of these things. But when it comes to UI, very rarely in enterprises, I think we have the sort of people on hand that can make things look great out of the box, and, and it tends to be something that's very hard to do. Um, does that answer your question? I guess it does. Okay, cool. So the next thing we're going to show you is this is what we would all think of as search, right? You type something in, you get back results. But what we're seeing more and more, and certainly over the last few years, is search in the sort of discovery and analytics side of things. I actually don't want any results back. It's all about the aggregate. Um, and the last thing we're going to show you is how we often present these things. In this case, we tell Solar, I don't want any results back. It's all about the facets. And it's all about giving me a 40,000 foot view of the data that's in there. And so we open a different HTML page. We have to do the same data plumbing. But in this case, it's, it's pretty much identical to what we already did. But what we start doing now is focus more on the facets. Just showing you a little bit about how we structure the pages. We break them up into grids and blocks. And grid-based design is sort of known for being very uniform and easy to lay out. And all we have to tell it is where the boxes should be, how many they should be side by side, and it will automatically determine how to behave as the viewport shrinks. So in this case, what we've just done is add a map, okay? We're getting back, let's say, coordinates, or we're getting back addresses. You plot them on a map, again, because that's what you expect to do. And that gives me a heat map or the distribution of where these people are, where these people were born or where they went to school. And I appreciate that the data is a little bit naughty, but I'm sure you can make the sort of mental leap to, to your different scenarios. And finally, we can see here, I want two blocks. I want the first one to be two thirds of the screen of the viewport and one to be one third. And I can put different components into this. For example, use the facets again, but this is just a series in my low visualization. I want to show it as a bar, and then I'll do another one, um, again, which is just a, a chart, but it's using a different series of data. And here is where we come to a real sort of scalability issue, right? Because the more complex these dashboards get, the more data points you have. And it's really easy to overload the, the browser. So what is actually happening here is because I know where my data lives and where the plumbing is, each one of these widgets know okay, I need to fetch some new data, right? I need to um, get a specific data set in a really efficient way. And if you think about all the code you would have to write to handle all of these requests, have them bubble up correctly, again, that's boilerplate, that introduces errors, and that makes it even harder for you to respond to what your users might want. How are we for time? Are we okay? Yep. Um, we added some breadcrumbs to show them what they've clicked on, but for each one of these clicks, they are able to use facets to dive deeper into the data, find exactly the sort of points that they're after. I don't know what you're doing now. And the final piece of the puzzle that we wanted to do, because it was kind of interesting, is let's have search give us the distribution of males versus females throughout history in terms of, of award winners. And again, that's something we can tell Solar to do. You know, bucket these things for me. I have to actually make two additional requests to get that information, but that's fine. Search is so fast, it doesn't matter if you're doing 20 requests on the page, as long as the user doesn't feel that. Um, so the last thing we do is we do two queries here. You can be doing more efficiently with Solar, I know. Um, but we're gonna get back all of these, these values per, per, um, per year, I think, or decade. decade. And the last thing we do is just show that as, as two series in the same, same graph. And it uses two different queries. They go to the same platform. And you have now given it that sort of area. There's very few women um, that have won these awards. But again, the user can start investigating this. Uh, we're just going to add a last thing there, which is sort of a call to action. Now I want to know who these people are. But if I start by saying, 
well, I'm interested in medicine, and in the last decade, how many men versus women? If I click on that, again, it refines my query. It updates my entire dashboard, and then I can end up by looking at who these people are. So this is it in terms of geekery. We just wanted to show you how you can, how you can realistically get from something very bare bones, as long as you've done your job on the data side, to something that users will find engaging. And we actually deployed this, so you can have a play around with the application. It's on Nobel. Divedeeper.io. Um, if you just want to sort of have a play around with and get some ideas of what you can do with search that's way beyond, I think, what, what we've been sort of um, doing lately. I'm done. Questions? At least you have to come and get M&Ms from us. We have a lot of M&Ms <laughs> still. Um, sir? Uh, Divedeeper.io. Um, and what we wanted to do is, um, there is a, a form there, this is a fairly sort of new application for us, but if you drop us a line uh, via the site, we'd be more than happy to give you an example of the application, so if you just want to play around with things and kick the tire, do, do let us know. If we are sort of a very transparent company and easy to work with, so if you just want our advice on something or you have a particular challenge, feel free to just drop us an email. Yeah, so it's a slightly sort of um, different use case. You, you pointed out rightly, this is the entire application. I think he's okay. I can hear him perfectly fine. Thank you, though. Very nice. Um, but again, that's just a different endpoint. That's just you're giving it HTML, and you expect, say, the formatting and the CSS to be in your application. And then you're just doing like a static include of the code. So we see that all the time. So, um, no, you don't. So, but in this case, what, what all that was happening is you're building out a UI and then you could choose to slot that into something else, but yeah, choose whatever technology you want. Technology doesn't matter. Sir? So this whole <coughs> the feature for application that's in the CSS that Google itself, or that Google itself doesn't support? Yeah, good question. So we actually have a little bit of middleware in between it, okay. and that gives us an abstraction between what the application is and, and the underlying data source. Because if you think of what we've been doing with databases, nobody writes directly to the database. You always use Hibernate or some sort of abstraction layer. And our customers, they wanted the same thing. They wanted to be able to switch from, say, Elastic to Solar without having to go through all of their application stack and change it. So you can actually modify that layer. That's right. Okay. And there are sort of, sort of hooks and points in there where you can inject your own logic. I always want to apply these rules to the query or I want, always want to change the response before it comes back. So Java, in, in our case, Java. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, we have data adapters to some 15, 20 different sort of search engines and databases. So you can have the same sort of user interface layer sort of talking to Solar and you might be sort of doing a call out to Documentum or some legacy system you might have. Oh yeah, good question. So we take a handful of them and we normalize them. And you know, because we know you're always gonna be asking for a certain number of rows back and things like that. And then what you saw in this example was how you then just wanted to do a straight pass through of parameters to solar. But then you have tightly coupled your application to it, right? But that's fine. Sir? So each of these uh, is defined in your own query, right? Not necessarily. So at the top of the page, we did fetch one overarching response that may fill most of the blanks, but then all you have as a developer is the choice to say, that one uh, time series in the middle has a thousand data points. So I wanna do that separately because I don't want the entire thing burdened by it. And that might come in half a second later or when the viewport scrolls over it, then you do that request. Any more for any more? Uh, yeah, JSON or XML. Um, so you can sort of bridge, you have this uh, veneer of web services in front of everything, but it's sort of, if you are using components on a page, say server side rather than client side, yeah. they're going straight via binary. So it's, it's a full abstraction from designer text to developer. Essentially, yeah. So the developers can do their thing. There's this contract between the UI widgets and, and, the, and the response from Solar without us hiding anything from it. Thank you. But again, we're just sort of describing our approach to it, you know, we're not trying to pitch you or anything. It's just sort of our learnings over the last few years. Any more? 
I know you had a question, Christian, didn't you? Yeah, so again, everything depends on how performant your backend is. And you may have seen in the past, you know, other technologies that you got from in a big yellow box maybe wouldn't respond in a timely manner. And it's really bad if the user would have to wait for secondary query to come back. So um, yes, Christian, thank you for this excellent question. Um, we're able to do multiple queries because again, you cannot expect to get everything in one hit. That's just not realistic in complex applications. So what you can do is you can make a choice. I know I will get this part of the response really quickly. The other things I want to fire off asynchronously after the fact. And you, you might rely on information from the first response before you can send off the second ones, or you can send them all in parallel if that's what the user needs. So again, it's all about just thinking as to what do the people have to do with this application and how do I best empower it? And then obviously, I have to do all my wizardry in, in solar to make it fast. Oh boy. So, so the, what do you mean on the desktop? So. Um, so if you can't go to a desktop script, it's offline scripting. So right, right. I, I've got a local installation local application that can run offline on like a mobile app or whatever. I see, yeah. Uh, or even on a laptop. And uh, would it be possible to just um, yeah, deploy it with the, with the application as well mm -hmm. on the desktop? Or is it too uh, waste consuming or resource consuming to do this? The UI layer is, again, if you think about it, what we do isn't particularly clever, right? Because all the heavy lifting, all the I.O. is happening in the index. This is just really string concatenations, right? So a typical web application will be very small. It will be, f if you look at the overall request response lifecycle, it's maybe 5 or 10%. Again, all the effort happens in these, in the indexes. So wherever you want to deploy this, uh, it shouldn't really matter. Thank you very much for coming to see us, at least. We thought nobody would come. <laughs>